Thanks everybody for being here on a Monday afternoon. It's Monday in the evening where my buddy is uh, right now. Um, we have a couple of things to talk about. One of the most important being um, that I hope everybody had a safe and sane Father's Day. It was a, a beautiful, amazing interview yesterday with Chad Salinga talking about being a dad in the rock and roll business. And my kids spoiled the hell out of me. So I hope yours did too. Um, I'm actually going to see my dad in Montana tomorrow. So then it's my belated uh, Father's Day gift to myself to see my pop. Awesome. Uh, we cannot start this thing off without thanking Five Star Guitars for being there with us from the beginning. They have uh, supported me uh, from the very first episode. Five Star Guitars in Beaverton, Oregon. It's available to do online lessons through Jennifer Batten, if you prefer. You can also uh, schedule in-house lessons. Um, you can set an appointment to come in and do retail purchases. They've got guitars for sale, a huge selection of guitars, and they do a lot of repairs. So go to www.5starguitars and check them out. We also want you to go to www.abductedbytheadies.com, which sponsored a event last weekend called Back to the Basement which was a fundraiser for Direct Relief COVID-19 frontline workers. It was a virtual concert with bands like A Flock of Seagulls and Naked Eyes and Animotion and Information Society and Real Life, uh, New Shoes, um, Escape Club, Nelson, all sorts of bands. And we had a world premiere video from Wang Chung where they redid their video for Everybody Have Fun Tonight as Everybody Stays Safe Tonight. You could get an event shirt through that site and all the benefits go to the uh, Direct Relief Fund. And you can also buy merchandise for the bands that performed, the bands that are supposed to be touring right now that aren't, and those proceeds will go help sustain those bands. So you can even get face masks from A Flock of Seagulls and Wang Chung. If you go to the website, sign up for their updates because they have a bunch of swag giveaways and they'll let you know about a couple of other events they have coming up. Six String Salute, which is an all-star guitar event um, that's also a virtual concert benefiting another um, great charity. Joe Satriani, Steve Vai, Jennifer Batten, like the world's greatest guitarists are all part of this thing as well. So go to abductedbytheadies.com and you'll get all that information by just signing up on their list. Now, with no further ado, all the way from the Motor City, the greatest producer and engineer that you're going to find on the planet, I have my friend and mentor, Chuck Alcazian, thank you for being here, my friend. My brother, <laughs> ranks. It's such a pleasure to be here, brother. I'm glad to see you, man. You, you, uh, I'm so glad to see you. You got to you know you you took off the quarantine growth, and uh, we. Uh, bet. I can't see the the quarantine hair, but it looks like you're uh, you're looking high and tight, which is good. Cut it all off. Just for the show, I'm sure. I appreciate that. Of course, professionalism. Yeah, it, uh, it's pretty funny. Let me ask you really quick. We should have been in Detroit in the next couple of weeks playing again at the Aretha Franklin Amphitheater. Yes. That's not happening. And so we're not gigging as much, but I'm betting because of your reputation and the state of uh, business there, you're probably still in the studio getting a fair amount of work done, huh? You know, it's interesting. Um, I've been getting mixes from all over the world yeah. because people want to create content. Right. Because they don't know how long they're going to be not playing. Right. And so what better, what a better time to then create music and get it out because the labels and even independent bands are, are really, you know, obviously a lot of people are struggling right now. So, you know, music keeps people happy, you know? So. Amen. I mean, we, we, we're going to get into the struggle part of it in a second, but I, yeah, I, was, I was wondering if you had guys like, uh, uh, you know, David Crosby, like pulling the mattress up and finding those old reel to reel tapes and Hey, Chuck, what can I do something with this? This is the rainy day that I need to mix this in and uh, do something with it. That's so crazy. That is the truth. Um, Ricky Medlock, um, called me, uh, all the Blackfoot stuff was done here at our studio a long time ago. And I've got probably 200 tapes. He just outtakes this guy. Wow. And, but all that stuff's gotta be baked, you know, and then transferred and then, we get to manipulate it. But, uh, yes, a lot of people have been calling, trying to ship tapes. The problem is, is getting them here, a lot of guys are really worried. They like want to drive them. They don't even want to ship them. Really? <laughs> so, yeah. They, yeah. So they're coming from like Florida to like California and they're just showing up and on your doorstep. It's and crazy. It's crazy. Like I had a guy drive from, I think, where was it? 
somewhere down like, like i think California, in mississippi yeah, What's that? Oh, no, and I, there was a replay on my, uh, my page here for a second, but you said somebody came from Mississippi and they showed up at your place? Yeah, and they dropped like 10 two-inch tapes off and I baked them for like three days and transferred them all. And, wow. Yeah, of course, <laughs> social distancing. Yeah, yeah, masks and all. The, uh, of course. You know, I'm, I can, we need to make sure we get you a flock of seagulls mask. I think that's, uh, that's an important I want thing. One. Yeah, man. Is it, does, it say, does it say I ran on it? It doesn't have this uh, glorious white seagull that looks like a phoenix of rising from the fire and <laughs> oh, i love it it'll match my underwear oh okay. yeah man I, that's interesting you weren't wearing underwear the last time i saw you but whatever no i was we, not i'm not, sorry no it's okay man uh, <laughs> uh well i'm glad that people at least are keeping you busy right i mean it's not the same kind of work that you would normally be doing but it's interesting though i always i was talking to a friend of mine who's another engineer the other day and he's like i've been busier than i've ever been yeah I think un, with all these unfortunate circumstances, I think from a creative standpoint, I think people have actually slowed down hmm. and stepped back because they're not sitting on a Prevo. They're not on an airplane. They're, they're home with their families and they're like, wait a minute, I've got all this juice and creativity in me and I've got to do something. I mean, who's to say I'm going to be able to do this in 20 years? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's where this came from. You know, when I started to do the yep. show, the whole thing came from me being on a break from touring and our guitarist said, Hey, let's just do a little Facebook live call. And uh, Jennifer Batten reached out to me and she said, you know, you got to think about doing this as a podcast. And I laughed and I said, only if you do one with me. And, uh, and so we did. And it was for me, it was cathartic and fun. I get to connect with my buddies and, you know, so you and I would normally get what 15 minutes backstage before a show where we could sit and talk shop. You know, and and then yeah. there'd be people bumping in there and asking you for autographs, and I, uh, you know, at least this way we can't get interrupted for the most part. You know, I love it. I love it I love too. It. I'm a. Uh, I, I have to. I have to confess. You said Jennifer Batten four yeah. times or like ten times or whatever. I love her. She is. When she was with Michael Jackson, yeah. Like I watched those videos from. I think it was the Bad Tour, wasn't it? Yeah. She she was uh is amazing and she is just i think she's just a stellar guitar player like i always been a, i've always been a big fan of hers that's the confession i'm jealous i'm gonna confess something else she's also the coolest person on the planet she is such an amazing human being man i'm telling you so i've heard that girl has uh she's saved my life in a couple of different ways man i am um, really absolutely yeah i i owe her like my spirit in a lot of ways. Oh, so yeah, she, she God lives bless. just up the road here. And um, some of the most amazing gigs I've ever done were with her. But even more importantly, you know, the real incredible times you get to share off stage are, they're priceless. I could never imagine the things that she's done for me. And so my, I'm forever indebted, man. She's amazing. Wow. Yeah, I am. Um, That's really cool to hear, man. Cause like you always, you know, I have so many people that I'm fans of, you yeah. know, and, I'm I'm just I always get very nostalgic when I you know I'm dating I guess where I'm dating us a little bit but those times in the 80s and and 90s even the 70s like I always meet people that I'll either work with or I'll see them at a show and I'm just like you do realize that's why I have that's what I do what I do you know that's yeah. why I play drums or piano right. or make records or whatever and and it's just surreal to me you know well. What's great for me to see is that you don't take any of that for granted, you know, that mm -hmm. I mean, it, you've done it for so long with so many huge artists, it would be easy for it to become mundane and, and maybe, you know, overlook the magic of some of that. But, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about that. You talked about being a drummer. You're a Detroit native? Uh, yeah, born and raised. Oh, okay. Um, but I, for a number of years, I was in Chicago. Okay. Um, I ran Streeterville Studios, um, which is just around the corner from CRC. Right. And I worked a lot in both rooms, actually, and um, spent the majority of the 90s in Chicago. Okay. Um, I had lost my mother early, mid-90s, and I kind of just lost my shit. Yeah. Uh, she passed at a really young age, and she's kind of like my support system in music going forward. and. I, at that time, I had already been doing it since I was a little kid, but um, it kind of made me spread my wings a little bit and leave the Motor City. And it, it was it was a strange time in Detroit. Music was just 
kind of slowed down a little bit and I wanted to um, just kind of see what else was out there. And I was really blessed. Let's just say that, you know, when you were already engineering and mixing, obviously when you went to that studio in Chicago, but yeah. tell me about the, the formative days of you in Detroit and what, uh, what inspired you to get up off the, you know, onto the drum thing and onto the production. Well, everyone knows the story. I, I always tell, I saw a kiss when I was like four or five years old. I think we all did. And I literally went as Peter Chris with aluminum foil all over me. And I was in the back window of my uncle's Monte Carlo with him and his buddies, probably partaking in festivities of sorts. At you know. four? Not myself. Oh, oh, oh you're, I was going to say, <laughs> clearly, Chuck. <laughs> and, and, and honestly, I was just enamored with the show and the bravado and the, I mean, it was just like, okay, yeah, sign me up. Yeah. It's cool. You know, sign me up. And then, you know, we went through the, the, I had my first Rogers kit. I had two milk crates as just like you probably did as a drum throne with the big cost headphones with my <laughs> little record player playing the captain and to Neil love will oh. keep us together. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> oh, oh. Muskrat love on my end, but yeah, I think I jammed to that too. It was a little slow probably, but yeah. no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but no, seriously, I, uh, I had an older stepbrother who just turned me on the like, like pro call harem, blind mm -hmm. faith, the who, um, at the time, like humble pie, uh, a lot of British invasion bands. You know? Wow. Okay. And I was really blessed because then my mom, my mother was an engineer at a motor company, but she was also a classical pianist. And um, she turned me on to like the Bee Gees, to Rachmaninoff, to, you know, I'm trying to think, gosh, Brothers Johnson, LTD. Oh, sweet. So all the funk stuff I was yeah. really into. But, but then when I found out, what a Led Zeppelin was or what a Jim Morrison was. Mm -hmm. It kind of took me to a whole nother level. And I married all that bravado, the showmanship with the chops, Yeah, you know, and here Man. I am. I, she used to, sh she used to, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. She shipped no. me off to, uh, as a single mom, my grandparents helped raise me. So, they always sent me after sporting events, like playing baseball and football and all that stuff, hockey. They would ship me off to uh, local recording studios. And I'd be a coffee boy. And I would just sit there. Really? Like at 10, 11 years old. So, okay, wait a minute. How did that connect? I mean, they, did they know people there in the studios that they thought, Chuck just needs to get in yeah. from the ground up? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because my mother was always an educator. Like okay. she was very intelligent, and she's like, "Hey, look, if you're gonna dick around with this stuff, I want you at least to have the skill sets to know what you're doing." Yeah. But trust me, I mean, I've jammed in garages my whole life, and you know, sure. you know the whole thing. But like, that was I was really blessed that she thought that way. Yeah, it's a gift. And man. all these engineers I used to hang with, and. Sorry, someone just walked in. Okay. Um, I, uh, I can't tell you how much that taught me. I was a little chucky. Little they chucky. always protected me. They always okay. protected me. So I never saw the bad stuff. Okay. And, and if I did, it was hidden from me. Yeah. If, you know, um, yeah. I think they felt an obligation to kind of, you know, come here, kid. Yeah. You know, and uh, I was blessed, man, oh, you man. know. I was blessed. So early in those days, who was coming into the, it was, um, was this, this is pre Chicago. So this is back in Detroit. Um, it's in the eighties, early eighties. Okay. All right. So because I'm, I'm 48. Okay. Yeah. I think we're just like a year apart. Um, mm -hmm. The, I was trying to think of the bands that were happening in Detroit. Um, you know, MC five had already kind of done their thing there. You, yep. uh, you, uh, it, it just preceded. I mean, you're right at the very beginning of where MTV was about to start. And uh, and so like any of those MTV bands that were, I mean, more bands from that era were kind of popping from Chicago, right? In, in Illinois, I mean, you had Cheap Trick that was like hot as hell right then. And um, I mean, Nugent was a Detroit guy that was, you know, he still Huge. had stuff going on right then. And uh, 
uh, but but it was a Bob little Seeger. yeah yeah i mean, I mean the, it's funny because i there's a there's a wave of what i think of detroit detroit sound happened i mean you had the 60s and 70s it was so huge for detroit right and yes. then and then it's amazing that uh you know your old client m m put it back on the map right for huge it's um but so as you were in those days in, in the studios and you're bringing coffee to the guys and you're helping out, did you run across any bands that stuck out to you that kind of were um, memorable moments? Gosh, I mean, I, I got to see a lot of bands like Skill, Romantics, for instance, Mike Romantics. Skill. Yeah. I mean, those were kind of, those are those moments, you know, um, I didn't realize what was happening because I wasn't mature yeah, enough. Sure. I was just a dumb little kid, you know, <laughs> just like hanging out. Um, after the riots happened in 67, um, the seventies were really cool. Like for a lot of different music styles, like Iggy. I mean, you had, um, you had the romantics, all these the punk bands that were coming out of um, New York were playing in Detroit. Um, and I was probably too young to really understand what sure. those things meant. But um, now as I look back, you know, Mitch Ryder. Okay. Yeah. You know, I've, I've produced Mitch Ryder. Like, are you serious? Like, you're kidding me, right? I mean, the, the Detroit wheels, you know, yeah. I mean, come on, you know, Johnny B, one of the killer drummers in the world. I mean, God. it's odd because you don't, that's again, that was going back to this nostalgic thing. It's yeah. like, you, you don't take it for granted it's just like you you, you kind of fanboy for a minute and then you realize oh man i better get my shit together because i'm gonna get my balls busted if i don't do something right but it's odd the the more famous someone is or the more successful someone is it seems the more kind and gentle they are when you're in that recording situation have you seen that as a real true mm -hmm. phenomenon yeah, it's, it's great to know. I mean, most people that are watching this that are, you know, part of my community, some of those people have been in the studio, um, you know, at a real professional level. Mm -hmm. A lot of these people, though, have their perspective or their um, idea <laughs> of what it might be, right? So, yeah. uh, um, you know, we've seen the movies, right, where the superstar is an asshole to the engineer and the producer and the bands have fights in the studio and, um, you know, their expectations about having, you know, certain things in the catering room while you're you know in their production but having this experience as little chucky i would yeah. imagine uh, made you feel more comfortable and in turn made these other artists as you start working with them more comfortable because you you it's not like you hadn't been there before right i mean you grew right. up in that environment so uh you honed your chops how did you end up getting like that were you did you kind of work your way into um, like a Studio C, Studio B, kind of working your way up the lat ladder to mix bands? Or did you just have, did you intern mm. with anybody? That's a really good question because I think, I think when I was coming up, there really weren't, at least in the Midwest, there wasn't like, it wasn't like Electric Lady or the power station that had like seven rooms going where mm. you'd have a first engineer, a second engineer, a third, uh, an assistant, you know. It was, it was more like, mostly just one room studios and you you just were thrown into the fire basically you know but i mean obviously you got hired at some point to to actually mix a band right so did uh, did somebody not show up and you just said ah i've been here i could do it is that, that really happened what happened? In Chi that happened in chicago to me okay um, i <laughs> this is the one story i always remember i actually had done some assistant work before that where I felt oh this is cool I'm making it to the big time now or whatever you want to say but one day I was in, in, in Chicago working and an engineer didn't show up and I was always the first one there okay and I was always the last one to leave and I swear I lived out of my backpack in a broom closet for most of my 20s wow because I by the time I would go home take my car or the train home in Chicago I'd be back working uh, so you know so anyways so I was always the first and last to be there so I kind of always I always wrote everything down I had this huge spiral notebook it was the Chuck book and I do have this book somewhere with my memoir really okay 
maybe one day, right? <laughs> so I'd write everything down. I'd just write down who showed up at what time, what did that person want for dinner that day? What did they want in their coffee? What, how do they like their mic, you know, microphone levels? You know, what do they want in their cans, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So one day I went in, I was assisting, I forgot the guy's name. We were mixing a Neil Diamond record. Um, okay. It was like hot August night, like to revisit it or something, okay. some crazy record. And it was turning into, this was when DVDs were starting to kind of, I think it was like laser disc actually. Okay. <laughs> or, you know, it was something that was just a new phenomenon. Sure. And um, there was a song that needed mixing and the guy never showed up and they needed to deliver the song to the label. And um, all I know is I remixed live love on the rocks for somebody and I had no clue what the hell I was really doing except I knew the song because I grew up with it. Sure. Well, let me and ask you about that it. process. I mean, as a fledgling new engineer remixing this thing. Um, I was just a little turd. Well, you know, and pardon the, um, the sort of uh, dumbing this down, but no. for, a lot, for a lot of these people that are out there that don't know about the production process, when you remix something, so there's a song that's been established, Love on the Rocks has been out there on the radio for, you know, 10 years. They want to remix it. What process do you go through as an engineer and a producer to make that song different, unique, stand out on its own to make it special? That's a, that's a really great question. I mean, that is, Thank you. that's a really, that's, <laughs> that's a deep one, man. It's a very simple answer though. Music is I mix, when I mix, I try to make a song sound so that you want to kind of re, rewind it. Like I, I mix it. So like how I would want to hear it as a fan. Okay. Okay. Then this is going to get into a whole nother conversation here. Sure. But I feel that a lot of engineers and producers do what they want. They're more ego driven. Um, I'm more nostalgic driven, if that makes any sense. Sure. I remember where I was the first time I heard Joe Walsh, Life's Been Good. Okay. And I'm like, what the hell is that keyboard sound? You know, in the breakdown. Sure, yeah. Or, so, you know, you know, like, I mean, when that guitar comes back in and he goes to the stanza, it's like, are you, are you kidding me? Right. What the hell is this? Yeah. So, I always try to make, I'll put an Easter egg or something in a song that makes me kind of give it that little Eddie Vedder edge where you can't understand what he's saying and you got to rewind <laughs> the listen. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I always mix like, I want to hear it. Yeah. It's not that hard. If you, if you take a song that's already recorded well and written well, see, I'm all about songwriting. If you're, sure. if, if you're having trouble mixing a song, there's an arrangement issue someone picked the wrong instrument as the focus focal point of the okay. song. Um, and uh, again, it's probably opinion based, but you shouldn't have to like struggle to get a mix happening. You know, if you're sitting there for days on a song, I think you need to revisit kind of your arrangement maybe. Well, okay. But the, for example, so if you're remixing love on the rocks, right, that yeah. song already has an arrangement. You know that the I song digress. Is, no, 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 no. But it's okay. So for that song in particular, how do you remix that to make it? Because all right, it's already at a level where people know it and it's huge. Um, so I mean, obviously, but it was wanna, live. It was live. Though. Okay, yeah. So you're remixing a live version of it. You want to give it a live feel, which and, it already had because it was recorded that way. Oh right. Oh right. Okay. Yeah. So so instead of enhancing. Most people would reach for the crowd and push the faders up and go, right. let's make it real sexy and big, right? Yeah. Let's, let's add some crowd noise. Let's <laughs> a, la, a la kiss a life. Right. right? Okay. Wait, it wasn't live? I'm kidding. Sorry. No. I am sorry. Actually, yeah. it, it was, but it was, was overdone. Right. That Eddie Kramer <laughs> interview is awesome, by the way. Okay. I take what I hear and I try to make it sound as, as much like a record as possible. Like, I, because... It's already going to sound live, mm -hmm. you know? It's like, you know, you probably have players like Ron Tutt playing drums. You got some of the best, like, string players that were hired wherever the heck they recorded it, the Greek sure. theater or whatever, you know? So and, the performance um, is already solid and great, and you don't have to totally, worry about that. Yeah. Totally. And so 
I need to make sure that the drums are slamming, the bass notes are heard, the vocals, number one, aren't muddy. I want it articulate. I want to give the goosebumps to the people that were at the show. Okay, cool. Yeah. You feel me? Yeah. I'm not going to basket and reverb and, and slather it and all sorts of, you know, zhuzh. <laughs> got to make sure. Gotta These are make technical sure terms, it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> that's a PJ Farley term. Oh, yeah. You, did you catch his episode of, with me? No, I didn't watch it, but PJ's a good friend of mine. I've yeah, recorded I him numerous times. He's a great dude, man. It was such a fun conversation with him, too. So that, uh, He's one of my favorite humans ever. And, yeah. um, but so when, when you're sitting there, you're like, oh, shit, what am I going to do? Well, it, it, it's already sounding dope because the players are great. Right. So you're certainly not going to vacillate on, okay, how loud the hi-hat is. Who right. gives a shit? Right. You know, is, are the drums blended? Is the bass cutting through? Is the guitar, is anything wonky? Is anything hurting each other? Sure. So it, it, it becomes some sort of like um, emotional math equation of sorts. That's really it. And yeah. The, 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 I, as the, the, is hair goose, standing up on goosebumps, you know? Yeah. Man, you know, that's got to feel so good out of, to produce something, to have it played back after having heard it so many times. Because in that process of remixing, right, you're, you're hearing parts over and over and over again. And it would seem like really difficult to keep, to keep your ears fresh and to keep the emotional connection there. But to have some point where start to finish, you can play this thing back in a loud, you know, ambient room and just get the goosebump moment. I think that's got to be some of the best feeling ever, huh? It's the greatest feeling in the world. And you just brought something up that's really cool. Um, I've never, ever complained to myself or to anyone about listening to something over and over again. Because when I mix, I don't really solo a lot of stuff. Okay. Do you know what I'm saying? Really? Yes. Um, yeah. I listen to the song. Always. Okay. I always listen to the song. Like, once I listen to the bottom snare mic, okay, it's too boomy. All right. I'm filtering it. It's okay. cool. I already know. I don't need to keep going back and forth. Sure. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I've always been, my love of music and nostalgia has always overshadowed the technical aspect of, okay. of just, you know, always just, hearing like a hi-hat i don't listen to a hi-hat i listen to the drum kit yeah and that's kind of how i've gotten through it all these years it's just been like i just try to i just try to listen to it as like what i want to hear it like as a song you know i uh i think when you listen back to some of the recordings then that you've done mm -hmm. the emotional attachment that you have to those things is probably what makes you stand out from other producers um if we were to a and b a production that you might do, um, say, you know, you work with Madonna, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, when I was a little guy, I was like just a coffee dude. Okay. I, I, I like, let me go a little later on. I mean, now you worked with Chris Cornell and Soundgarden. That right? was okay. Yes. So you take a uh, mix that uh, you do versus Brendan O'Brien or you versus uh, whatever the Dust Brothers or something that's going to remix something, yeah. you know? So, yeah. Um, the differences that you might hear, the nuances, and the, the um, um, you talked about the nostalgia. Having the nostalgic connection, I would imagine, especially for Soundgarden, right? Because every one of those songs is a story in, in, in all sorts of ways. I mean, every, man, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. Yeah. Every time you hear Chris Cornell speak or sing, it's like gospel. You know, and then when you had that collective of that band, um, whether it be Matt Cameron on drums or Kim Thale on guitar, if you had each instrument isolated, it's still greater as the whole, right? The whole being greater than the sum of its parts. And when you got to work with them, I would imagine that your love for nostalgia would really come through in that piece because it's such emotionally driven music that. I would think that you and Chris really connected well with that, that your traits. How long did you I work think, with him? Well, I, I hooked up with him through a while ago. We did like this live recording thing at the studio 
Um, and I recorded a song called Halfway There, which is on the album King Animal, which originally was done by Joe Barisi, who is a friend and is, is one of my heroes. I love him dearly. Um, and Chris loved the acoustic. I did like this acoustic arrangement of it. And okay. um, he asked for the Pro Tool session. I happened to record it. And um, their management called me and said, Chris wants to mix this. And I'm like, okay. So I just sent it off. And the guys at Universal called me and they're like, um, well, Chris loves your mix of it. Do you mind if we use it? He's can't, he can't even get it close to yours. Nice. And it was really strange for me to hear that because then he and I developed this communication and then he was very secretive about a lot of things that he did. And I miss him dearly sure. as we all do. And um, he would work with some of the best producers in the world. Right. But he had this, he had his go-to producers, you know, um, like Ron St. Germain and like, um, Joe, Joey Barisi and all those guys. And, 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 but he always had this other side where he was married to Vicky. Like he had an ethnic side to him. He liked a lot of the family stuff and I'm Armenian. So we kind of connected on this like really different kind of level. And, um, it, it was just, it was just strange. The whole situation to me is just kind of strange now. It's just kind of, yeah, no, you know, um, well, I certainly don't mean to bring up melancholy parts of it. I mean, I, I think honoring him and, you know, is, a, is an amazing thing. Um, because you had the emotional connection, I think, I, I would think that more of these people would seek you out because they feel taken care of and they feel like you're passionate about it enough. I try. That, yeah. yeah um, I mean, I know that's why Mike Skill, you know, raves about working with you with his stuff. And um, oh, Mikey, I love him. Yeah, man, he's again, he's like one of those guys that I I love heart and spirit. He's an amazing human being. Um, his you know work with Romantics is phenomenal, of course, and the stuff he's doing on his own that you've helped produce is fantastic. You know, so thank you. Yeah, man. He's, I, I, he's I'm sorry. I I I, I got to tell you, Michael is probably one of the most harmless people in the world i mean he's such uh he's like a savant like he's like i mean the guy wrote so many songs like they right. sold i don't know how many gazillion records right to this day you hear what i like about you and talking in your sleep and you can't go to a wedding without hearing what i like about you. that's true yep yeah. And he'll tell you the story about writing it in his parents' dining room, right? <laughs> yeah. And he was just trying, he was just kind of playing off of like a Townsend lick or a Kinks lick. Right. Yeah. He'll that, probably, he probably told you that story. I'm sure. I haven't heard that story. No. And we talk about, but you know what? One thing I try not to do with him is go into rehash studio stories that much, unless we're out on the road. If we fly together and we're out doing yeah. gigs together, but, um, Man, he's had to answer the same question so many times, you know, even when we, did, it. When we did the interview together, we talked about yeah. some of that stuff on the show. But um, one thing I love about Mike too, is that uh, he too is very passionate about everything's involved in between family, between activism, between uh, uh, the creative other sides. I mean, Mick, his kid is such a great photographer and really truly an artist. And, you know, I love him. He's amazing. I mean, that whole family, but you Cheryl know, Cheryl and Mick are the best. You know? I mean, yep. the, I mean, know. Mick, Mick is, I'm sorry. Mick is, uh, Mick is, is so talented. And yeah. I mean, think about this. Your parents are in the tubes and the romantic, right? And you're like living in this like super like rock environment your whole life. But they did such a great job, you know, not sheltering him, but, you know, protecting him from, you know, letting him be artistic and, and, and still enjoying life. And oh, I think yeah. that's a cool scene. When you see grounded, centered people like that, it, when it's, you know, yeah. it is surprising because it could go the other realm where uh, two amazingly talented rock stars with a kid could seem entitled had they not mm -hmm. really shown him, you know, proper sort of guidance and, uh, you know, I work a lot with Dale Bozio, you know, and, and when um, first did shows together back in 2002, I noticed that her teenage son had, had a little bit of a 
chip, you know, um, there's probably a little tiff between, uh, you know, Terry and Dale back then mm-hmm. and kid had a chip on his shoulder. And I remember feeling like, wow, this guy's going to be trouble if he doesn't get a little bit of uh, direction and look at him now. He's just like Mick, one of the most amazing kids, also a photographer, creative, so sweet and centered, you know, and it's nice to see. I remember, I remember I was at a show and Dale was playing and her son, what's her son's name? Yeah. So she has Troy's, I mean, she has a couple of kids, but Troy's the one that's always on the road with her. Okay. He was, he was skateboarding. I remember at, at Pine Knob or at DTE. Yeah. And I, I believe if it was him, he came up to me and I just started asking him questions and he was just like, he was the sweetest kid, man, oh, back good. then. I remember, you know, and it's funny that you said that. So I actually remember that moment. You know, I mean, the fact that it stands out to you is un- it's great because that says something about you, but also it says that it's a rarity, right? Because when you see an entitled punk teenage kid from a rock star family, yeah, mm-hmm. you kind of expect him. Uh, Jason Bonham's kid, you know, would, would go out and sell his dad's merch off the side of the truck on his own to get himself a little Far scratch. from it. Yeah, but but you know, back in the day, that you know, when those kids are younger, you know, they you know they're just finding their way. Um, I think I would probably have been even more of a pain in the ass had I been you know a rock star kid. My dad is a jazz, you know, a, a, a big band Dixieland player, and uh, raised me right just, you know the, the right way. It's all good. I was kind of a dick though in high school. I just wanted to rock. You know, I think we're all kind of dicks in high school because we're again, like you said, we're trying to find our way. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting as, as we're like the same age, um, I, I always hung out with everybody in high school because I was a sports guy. I was a music guy. I was in, in the art. Um, um, I wasn't like gothy and I wasn't like, I had really long hair, but like, I wasn't like, like ratty, you know, I always just kind of liked everything, you know, and, and, but I had my dicky moments, you know, I, I remember, you know, it's funny because I, I'm, you know, with Facebook, you know, you see, I have friends that I went to elementary school with that I still talk to this day because of Facebook. Wow. And I find it really interesting. Again, we circle back to nostalgia. And I think if you know where you came from, it's really good to know where you're going. You know? Yeah. It's funny that can be a curse and a blessing to be reconnected with people on Facebook after that long, right? Yeah, for the I most don't part, disagree with that. Um, I try. I mean, Facebook is a necessary evil for a lot of us, right? And mm-hmm. I, I think uh, there's a lot of benefit that can come from it. I try to spend as little time as possible on uh, anything that's not completely productive and positive driving my day. Yeah. I don't watch the news. I, um, I encourage my kids to not get baited into stuff on social media because uh, uh, I don't see constructive things coming from it. You know, I see people that, uh, I mean, I, you know, you and I together, I mean, we've, we've seen so much angst. It, it's anxiety driving when somebody that is so ridiculously un... Um, the whole thing's a shit show. It is. And so for me, I go, okay, you know what? I can take what I want from it and go on to uh, uh, the rest of my day, you know, um, because I don't have control over 99% of everything in my life. I just want to be able to have control over my little show and then communicate with my friends and people here and then go off and do my thing with my kids. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny. There's probably a parallel too with you in the studio, right? You've got a major production. So say a label's got you in the studio with a major national artist. Mm -hmm. Um, You know how to do your job. Mm-hmm. You also know that the client probably has uh, you because you've learned to deal with different personalities. You know where to push and pull, and uh, um, maybe we can talk a little bit about that. About one of those artists that uh, they were, you know, budget was solid. Um, it was kind of a big name, so you knew you had to be on best behavior. You don't want to burn a bridge, but you also mm-hmm. had to sort of uh, um, lay some stuff down so you could you stood your ground and made sure that they knew that you know what you're doing. It's interesting. Um, I'll get to that. Um, okay. A lot of younger bands that I've worked with, more so. Okay. Um, because of the, I don't want to say inexperience level. Um, you can't you can't get angry or you can't harness somebody if they don't know 
if they've never experienced them. Okay. Okay. So I find that more of the medium size bands have a little bit more of a, 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 some trouble with laying stuff down and, and getting their voice heard because they're, they're bigger than not being known, but they're not big enough to where they can do whatever the heck they want. Right. So I find myself being 80% of a therapist more so and 20% a producer oh, or bad. an engineer. It's just hard. You know, sometimes you, you got to hone in on, you got to read the room. Yeah. You got to read the room. You know, it's like, I'm trying to think of a good story. Um, I have so many great stories, but like, I'm trying to think of one that's germane to this. Um, sure. um, I think that if you can read the room and you garner the trust of the individuals as a whole, they'll come together and they'll believe in you. There's a lot of flag waving and, and championing, you know, the whole time, you know, and, uh, it's, it's not easy to do. Oh yeah. No, you know, that's like, any other professional in this business, right? If you're a front man or you're a tour manager or you're, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've got elements of babysitting duty and duty that you have to do. And, um, you know, if you're going to do it at a professional level, right. I yeah. think about some of the artists you worked with, um, Eminem, you know, mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, it certainly put Detroit on the map again, right. In, uh, yeah. in the space. So what, at what point were you working with him? Well, I was, I was working with a friend of mine named Steve King who mixed a lot of his stuff Okay. Um, with Dre and those guys and the Bass Brothers. Um, and Steve's no longer with us anymore. He taught me a lot of great stuff. Um, I, was, I was in early. Um, one of my good friends went to high school with me. His name is Paul Rosenberg, okay. who managed Eminem All and right. still does, and who's now the president of Def Jam. Right. And I was always involved in those hip hop scenes. I love really? hip hop music. Yeah. yeah. Early I hip hop stuff. It. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Run DMC, yeah. that, that kind of, all right. Yeah. I mean, like DJ Quick, uh, um, I'm trying to think, of, like the Dayton family, MC Breed. These are artists I've all worked with. Too. Okay. Yeah. Um, a good friend of mine, Bernard, uh, Bernard Terry, uh, produced like Ready for the World. Oh, nice. And, MC Breed and then all the bands from Flint, Michigan. Okay. And it, it was known for more of um, its um, R&B and hip hop and that kind of scene. And I just enveloped myself in different cultures. Sure. Um, because after a while, like, like rock was getting a little stale. Yeah. You know? And, and it was like, we were coming out of like hair metal going into... The grunge um, thing grungy you know and, and then you and then you had like a bunch of like really cool dave matthews kind of bands right the sp spin doctors and you know that kind of thing the little affair thing was happening right there too right the, which was great yeah you know? yeah, the, yeah yeah but uh but yeah then you but started hip hop yeah yeah so hip -hop. When, when hip hop was really i mean that was an evolutionary stage for for that genre for sure man and mm -hmm. you had guys like snoop coming out and just really, oh. you know uh, so with Eminem and you worked with Paul Rosenberg, uh, yeah. you, uh, did they say, you know, we need you in here to, to, and you said Steve had been working with them primarily. Yeah. I okay. would just, I would just go and chill with Steve Okay, and then, and then I would just meet all these people and just, it was like, Hey, it was always a, just do that kind of thing. Okay. It was never like, can I, sir? Or, you right. know, yeah. it was just whoever was around always did stuff. And, um, and what was interesting is, is um, then I started working with Royce the Five Nine, who was um, one of Marshall's like go-to like hype guys. Okay. And I worked with them on a couple different projects. I, I wasn't like the only one. See, hip hop is like really different than rock music. You always get different producers on the same record. Right. The other guys, I don't like calling it doing beats, but like. Right. Writing, writing songs with, yeah. the, with the hip hop artists, um, you know, deriving a beat, changing the style of the tune after they write their lyrics and 
get yeah. the vibe of the flow. The beat term is such a different thing now. I know when I hear that, I think, wait a minute, but the beat is what I'm playing, right? But, right. but yeah, no, but beat and hip hop is that really is the structural melody and the 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 the, the groove and the the beat. I mean, it really is the bed beneath the lyric. But it, uh, it's interesting because Detroit was always always a uh, a mecca. Uh, having you know Motown artists and their children, right? And um, yeah, it was uh, we were always around each other. That was kind of the thing. Like everyone, one tried to help each other. Really? And then when hip when hip hop took off, um, a lot of hip hop artists didn't realize where they came from, and they forgot. Really? And then yeah, and and then a lot of them came back and uh, tail between the legs. But then most of them are really successful now. So okay. right, it's interesting. Well, you can write a book about that. Uh, yeah, I bet there are a handful out there. But I, I'm thinking, yeah. um, let, tell me about work ethic. I mean, from what I understood, like Marshall Mathers, there's not many guys that work harder than that dude. Um, and uh, did you see that in the studio with him? I saw some of it. You know, I I wasn't the guy who would always sit in a room with those guys and like he would write with Dre and all these people. I, I, I wasn't really blessed to be in those inner circles. Okay. Those are, that's really deep. That's yep. really deep stuff that I wouldn't know a damn thing about, but okay. I knew I, I was always a guy on the outside, like who would help kind of commercialize stuff. Okay. I, I kind of have that reputation, you know, as a, a mixer, as a, an engineer and, a dude you know like i was always trying to get people to think about your your cousin joe but your little sister lisa at the same time okay how do Wide, we get widen the demographic to, correct okay correct. um but i mean i wish i could tell you some really sexy stories about that stuff but you know uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure you've got some, maybe not in in terms of like, you know, the Marshall Eminem vibe, but, but uh, working with artists, who do you feel like you had the most involvement with? Hmm. Hmm. You had to ask me that one. Yeah. It's a good question too. I like artists that you think aren't gonna take off or they, they, they their confidence level is really low. And which is kind of an oxymoron in this business. But right. Like, um, I like people who are very humble and downplay what I had. I had an artist once that um, I'm trying to think of her name. I can't remember. This was a long time. Ago. It was like 20 years ago. She thought she was the worst thing. And she had a voice of an angel, man. She was just amazing. And she wrote these, these songs that like were just really commercial melodically driven and she didn't even know what she was doing she's a horrible guitar player she was she was one of those capo movers you know what i'm saying she would just she sure. couldn't play it record. yeah she would just move the capo and um i ended up getting her some sort of licensing deal on one of her songs for like a uh a television show or something and i think now she just like writes songs for like television shows and really and well, I mean, as a producer and engineer, that's not typically your role, but how, how does that fit into your wheelhouse? I mean, I, if someone's got the chops, I'm always going to spread the word. Okay. You know? um, but, just... but my point of that was like, she didn't even, she didn't even want to record. Like her okay. parents brought her in kicking and screaming. And she just, she just had this like natural gift to be like, you know, happy birthday to you. I mean, it's like done, you know? Wow. It's interesting. Yeah. Well, I know, um, I mean, there's such a breadth and depth of people that I know that you worked with. I know Corey Glover, his newest project, right? You did some stuff like on his. That, that, that record I did not do. The one with George oh. Lynch. Yeah. You talk about that one? Yeah. No, I did not do that record. But okay. That is one of my favorite records. Is it Ray on that record? Yeah, Lazier. Yeah. You, you yeah. Had told me about it. I, didn't, I was thinking that you had done it, but you were the one that hit me to it a couple of years ago in Detroit. No. I did not do that record. Okay, all but right. I, I was supposed to do some mixing, I think, for uh, some of those guys. That's okay. what it was. All right. And um, the connection kind of fell apart because of some politics. Um, but that record is just, I forgot the name of the band. Um, yeah, Ultraphonics, right? 
I think so. Yeah. 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 I just, yeah, that's, that was crazy. Good stuff, man. But um, I'm, you know, the, there's so many artists that, uh, that you and I had talked about you working with. Um, and I didn't necessarily want to talk about dirt or, you know, the positive experience, maybe tell me dream project, um, a, a, like a current band today, you know, to, uh, you know, Zeppelin's not around or whatever. So no. a band that's out there today that you see your vision being able to be something that could help them enhance their sound, you know, or, or at least fit and meld to their sound. I have three answers. Okay. 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 The first, the first dream record that I would love to do would be, I'd like to do a Lenny Kravitz record. Oh, cool. Because I feel that his childhood and his upbringing and his spirituality would lend itself to my nostalgic rock. Love it. I think I would make a kick-ass Lenny Kravitz record. Okay. That, it would be a commercial Lenny Kravitz record. Though. Sure. Yeah, I yeah. think that would be a, a dream gig. I mean, obviously you've got like the Stones and stuff like that, and you know, but 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 I think Lenny could still bring it. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, you know what I mean? I, yeah, absolutely. You know, I uh, my friend downtown Julie Brown's been having drum. Let me give her drum lessons, and she. Uh, love we, her I, it's awesome that those are the songs they're all lenny tunes that we're working on right now and she on the beach in the dominican republic she was saying teach me drums on this song and you know i i'm just like okay well you've never played a drum kit before but you're sitting here in a bikini <laughs> i have to figure out some way to teach you this you know well so, i mean you could at least show her how to play the two and four that's it's exactly what we did and i gave her i i, I told her how to count you know, so yep. I said, I don't want you to stop counting out loud. You count out loud and you do this movement. I gave her my sticks and I said, all the way home on the airplane. I don't care if they get pissed at you in the seat in front of you. I want you to practice that all the way home and remember the count. And then the next time I see you, I want you to have that part baked so that we can sit down and work on beats. <laughs> and she remembered every bit of it, man. And her husband got her this drum set. She lives on the edge of Lake Como in Italy and right. pl plays out over this, you know, like a, a view over the lake. And she get she has her drums out on the patio, right? And just booming. And she said, now the neighbors are like, shut the, up. you know, it's like it's like George, George Clooney's on the other side. He's like, <laughs> right, hey Jay, turn that shit off. That's right, man. All but, right, I'll be off with some, some cocktails. Right? <laughs> that's exactly what she'd be like, man. Of course, but, uh, I. Uh, but you can't go wrong with Kravitz, man. And she nailed it. With no, that. Um, so all that's right, funny. So, okay, we, so that would be. That's different. almost that. That's like what I think I would like to do. Yeah, I, dream. Oh man, dream wise though, I think I should be, or at least there's a couple of us. I think I'd like to make the last Kiss record. Oh wow! Okay. And I'm going to tell you why. Let's okay, because I wouldn't let them. I would put them. Here's that nostalgic thing again. Okay, Kenny. Kenny Kerner and Richie Weiss, you know, Bell Sound, you know, like that. I right out of right out of the Eddie Kramer demos, like that time period when they were like, "We're gonna take over the world. Yeah. We're gonna look like a bunch of transvestite." Right. We're gonna do it. Yeah. I would take them somehow, some way. I would get Gene and Paul to think about where their head. I would put them in that moment where their heads were at. And I think it'd be somewhat cathartic for them on some level. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think they'd actually start crying. Not because of, because of, again, those deep rooted things on their, in their data stick that they probably have completely forgotten about right. in the last 40 years. Right. But I would love to make a record the same way, like Strutter. Like, yeah, like right. the way I heard it, like, you know, Nothing to lose. Right. Oh, man. You know, just Press that. to kill. That, yep. I mean, oh, come on. I mean, all day, you know. Right. I mean, rock and roll over. I mean, but I want to make a record. You know, I actually thought about calling Doc McGee and seeing if they're even thinking about doing a record after this end of the world tour. I, I, it's, you know and, that there's got to be something in the works, always. But they always produce their own records because, you know, well, Gene and I have been doing it our whole lives, you know. Yeah. Uh, yes, we've been doing it our whole lives, and so you know, it's like, 
giving up those keys. But yeah, if Doc was able to make it happen for you, that would be a great pairing. I would be like, let me cut one song. Let me just, let's, let's just, let me cut one song. Let's use all the old gear. Yeah. Let's not use a reissue Iceman. Let's use a real one from like 19, you know, like from, from the Love Gun tour. Let's get Peter's old kit. Nice. You know, let's, let's use the beat up Zildjian's Eddie used. Let's, you know, oh, sorry. No problem. Someone's calling me on my phone. I no apologize. Problem. I was supposed to go on the airport. Um, I, I would just do everything I could to make it as old school. Even like the old puffy balls that go on the U87, oh. you know, that stink like shit. And they're like, you know, <laughs> just everything, you know, what, what you guys eat? I want to know what you guys ate. Well, we went to this deli down the street. Okay. That's what we're eating. I love it. I don't think anyone's ever said that to them. God, yeah. Well, Tommy Thayer sure hasn't because, you know, you know, he doesn't want to upset the apple cart. But, but, no means. But, you know, I would bet that Doc would be the guy that would be able to make that happen for sure. So give him a call and then tell him (sighs) we talked about it here first. Yeah. Of course. But see, the thing is, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be so stressed over would it be Peter and Ace? Or would it be Eric and Tommy? Now, see, Eric's a great guy. Yep. And Tommy is as well. And Tommy's a great guy. And they do it well. Yep. But there's some sort of something that had to have happened. Or there wouldn't be an Eric or Tommy. You know, for sure. It it might... In Kiss. you, You might lose Gene and Paul really being able to get in that character without... Tommy and Eric just doing it because those guys are able to emulate enough. Cause I think if Peter and Ace were in there, Paul and Gene wouldn't let down their guard, man. They couldn't go back to the days. Of, you know, I, I just don't think they could, but that's a whole separate interview. I like, a, I like this thought. So, you know, just put earmark it, right. Cause then will you assist, gonna, will you assist me? Absolutely. Hell yes. Okay. Yeah, man. Well, uh, okay. uh, you know, um, Tommy, could potentially be watching this right now if you know we're we're buds he's portlander you know and we see each other a lot and uh that crew you know is in our circle man so and then doc last ladies and gentlemen mr tommy Thayer, <laughs> shock me <laughs> i gotta say tommy tommy i'm i think he is i mean he was like he was in black and blue right he was yeah and then he was the tour manager, right? Right. For Kiss. Yeah. yeah. Like he, he was their everyday guy, right? He was everyday guy and produced, you know, he edited the DVDs and yeah, put together all the meet and greets and everything for a while. Yeah. He had many hats to wear. He, uh, one of my good friends, Jason Hartless, okay. who works with me, um, who plays with Ted Nugent. He's a drummer in Ted Nugent's band. Okay. And he's one of, he's like my go-to session drummer. He, he engineers it here at Pearl Sound. And, oh, sweet. And, yeah, he's a great guy and uh, just graduated from Berkeley. Shout out to Jason. All right. right on, Jason. He's good friends with Eric Singer. Okay. And, and it's funny. And, and their family's good friends with Ace Frilly too. Okay. And his godfather is Richie Scarlett. Oh my God. Wow. So this is like, there's this like entwined yeah. thing of kiss going on. <laughs> I know I'm close. Yeah. Yeah, and then I, I got the fair thing going. Yeah, you know, there's there are definitely more connections for sure. That we can we could I bet we can make something happen for you. You know, let me talk about this. You were going to go on for a third record, but you're a drummer. What's your dream drum gig from a band now Ooh. these days? To play or record? Play. Doesn't matter either one. If it recorded is better, then that's good. Space Age love song. <laughs> <laughs> really. <laughs> no. It is one of my favorite songs in the whole it's world. It's a great song, man. I love playing it. My favorite song to play it. <laughs> oh Every time I hear that, I think of the NBC call letters. Yeah, man. They should get some kind of royalty from it. <laughs> anyway, no, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Heckle. I got to he throw it. He heckles behind the console. Jesus, Jenny. I'm trying to think. Drum wise. I totally put you on the I, spot. God, no, there's so many kick-ass drummers. Okay, but we're talking alive. 
Yeah, so I'm thinking of a band that's out there. I mean, there are still bands touring, like Stones and Aerosmith and all that. Or you could take a modern day band if there's somebody that totally rocks your world that you think, oh, I want, I would just love to do. One of those drummers needs a sub for a week, and you're just that guy for a oh, week. Gosh. I would take any Greg Bissonette gig. All right. I think I'd have to say Greg Bissonette because I would get a chance to play with, I would, like, Richard Page and Ringo and Luke and oh right, I mean Ringo's All Star Band. Yeah, I'm thinking so just okay. because I'm kind that's of a nerd cheating, like that. But uh, that's no, that's good though. That's cool. Okay, that's a- I'll give you a real band that's not like made of rock stars. That's like put together rock yeah. stars. Yeah. Let's see. Um, shit, Kiss. Okay, get yep, that works. I mean, I mean. Yeah all day long i mean yeah but i I would love to play a night with rush oh yeah because i'm a dork no that's not dorky at all man that's legendary you know i mean if they say to play the whole 2112 record that i learned when i was like nine years old i mean yeah that's pretty heavy that works i i like those i i hadn't asked you know people this question really but I uh, I love that you wear so many hats as a producer and as a drummer, as an engineer. Um, I've got some friends here in Portland that are engineers and um, it's interesting how much different everybody's creative space leads them to, you know, um, my, my buddy's here. I mean, I can, I can listen to a record and go, oh, okay, that's definitely a Rob Dacre record. I know that sound, you know, or I mean, um, you know, there's a Chuck Alcazian sound. There's a, mm-hmm. you know, um, there's a, you know, enough like Butch Vig sound, you know, I mean, there, it's cool to be able to have enough of a voice as an engineer and a producer to get that kind of sound as drummers go, you know, what you resonate with, you know? And so it's nice to be able to have, you know, just like the, the sort of, that's like the, what you get your rocks off on, you know, I mean, it's, I know. get yelled at, I get yelled at a lot because people have told me like your drums sound too big yeah. or your guitars <laughs> sound too big. It doesn't, it's, it's, it almost sounds fake. Yeah. Well, I'm like, okay, have, have you, have you listened to some of the biggest records ever in the history of music? Okay. Let me, shall I, shall I for one minute? When you do, I want you, cause I was going to ask you, what's the perfect record? Oh, Son- I, sonically. I, I, sonically okay i'm gonna go there okay okay but drum wise let's talk about this okay mickey curry every yeah. hall and oats record. Okay. Yeah. any any mutt lang record you got foreigner the right. outlaws you've got oh wait acdc oh wait hold on hold on yeah. jeff Leppard. Right. sorry i forgot about them right think about this Chilly. you've got i mean come on bro yeah. every major record that's ever sold in the multi-platinum level has got the biggest kick-ass drum sounds in the right. world. Right. Yes. I don't care if it's a Jimmy Keltner sample on a Lind drum. Right. I don't care if it's a, if it's a. Um, oh wait, Tony Thompson. Pause. Oh jeez. Pause. God bless you. I yeah. miss you dearly. Hold on. Hold on. Power Station. Yeah. Chic. Yep. Really? Okay. Yeah. Lenny White. Steve Jordan. Right. Jeff Percaro. Right. These are big drum sounds. Yeah. Drums hit right. Yeah. Drums hit with finesse. Sure. And they're not arming. They're right. resting properly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the list goes on, bro. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that some of the biggest records now, but then you get someone like Mooney. Yeah. The drum sounds were kind of not really that big, but there was like, there's this, this dancing thing, you know, you had the ginger Baker thing. Oh, right. you had yeah. all this, you know, There's a this melody. Thing. The Freddie Gruber method. Right. Yeah. Dance, dancing on the drums. And, and again, Neil, God bless him, studied that. And you can see. The what change, the evolution. 90, 96, 97. Right after, right after the burning for buddy thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. When he, he switched. In, he, he did. He pulled the tiger woods on our right. ass. Yep. And, and, the Freddie Gruber method, you know, and I, to this day, I always tell drummers in the studio, get on the drum, get off, be fluid. Yeah. Cause if you're fluid, you don't need to hit a crash every two bars. Right. Because, cause your mind, your mind is going, okay, I got I'm, I got a groove, man. Yeah. I got to so feel Do that. you do that in the studio as a producer? Are you saying, Hey, drummer guy, is yeah. that, that's part of your technique is just say, Hey, they man. hate me. Well, no, they, you know they, what? 
Well, if they're thin skin, right? I mean, it really, because, yeah, you're, you're... Like, the first two days, they hate me. Yeah, and then they And realize. then they hear their drums, and then they go, wow, did I play that? And I'm like, right. yeah, all you had to do is step back for a minute and realize, because sure. not a lot of them have headphone experience right. or in-ear experience. So they're beating the shit out of these cymbals because they want to hear them because yeah. they paid 300 bucks for them. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right, yeah. And their guitar players are coming in at like 80 to 100 dB. You know, I always tell bands before we do pre-pro, I always have a set of plastics or dowels and one of my old Remo practice pads, right? The gray ones with the, yeah, you know, the pad with the, on the little snare stand. And I make everyone play acoustic or through little pig nose amps or whatever. And we sit in a circle. And that's the only way to really hear what's going on melodically okay. and rhythmically. Cool. And yeah. spiritually, too. I sure. Think. Yeah. I mean, there's a connectivity there that isn't drowned out by just overloading things. I see that. Um, all right. So, sonically, the perfect okay, record. Okay. The perfect record. Shit. Do you ask everybody this? Nope. You're the only one I've ever have. This is all spontaneous this, stuff, man. I just love going off the shit. cuff, but but I trust your ear and your heart. Okay, so there's a heart, there's a heart answer, and then there's an ear answer. Okay, let's take. And then both. there's there's actually uh, an enjoyable answer. Makes the feeling. What makes you feel good right? To listen to it. This is funny it's because brilliant. honestly, this is like it really is like a relationship. You're talking about. Do I break up with that girl? Because my head tells me not to mm -hmm. but my heart tells me i can't take it and she's fun to be around right so this right. is the uh, this record analogy is the, the relationship thing okay sorry it's go ahead. absolutely true no no you're 100 percent right and yeah. um i speak in analogies a lot so I'm, i like it i i welcome it because yeah. it kind of helps people decipher what the hell you're trying to say to them. sure so the head um, answer the head answer would would probably wow see wait let me start from the heart let me start okay. from the heart because i'd have to say I, I any of the beatles stuff or frank sinatra stuff because it was so passionately created okay but you can't say any of there's got to be specific performance Fuck. right the white album oh yeah yeah okay i think i think Oh man, you're killing me on that one. No, this is good, man. This is a, it's fun to think about. Oh, see, I'm a huge like Bob Clear Mountain fan, you know. So a lot of those records were made when consoles were new. Yeah. And you had flying faders, and you had you were actually playing the desk too. So oh, okay. Let me take off my producer hat for a minute and just talk from the heart. For yeah. Me. Okay. Okay. I'm going to say, I think one of the best recorded records from the heart would be Pink Floyd, Dark Side. Wow. Yeah. I mean, can't you just aim a little higher? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm 40 years in the Billboard 200. Right. I mean, yeah. Crazy. Records as old as me. Yeah. But there's something sonically about that record that's pleasing. Sure. Well, I, we talked a little bit about the story that's being told, you know, and these things, uh, every Pink Floyd record kind of has a story. That one in particular, I was surprised. My 18-year-old son and I were talking about the other day. He was he knows the record inside and out. Uh, we heard Eclipse. I'll see you on the dark side of the moon. I heard him singing it. I'm like, how do you know the lyrics to this? How do you know this song? He was a Beatles aficionado at 10 way more than I ever was. He hit me to mm -hmm. so much magic in the subtleties in the Beatles records that I'm, I feel blessed that he had that stuff that he introduced me to. But the Pink Floyd thing, he's, you know, we've got our friend Greg Wilcott, who's been adding comments here. Um, he's a great guitarist and dear friend of my family. And he hipped my kid to Jimi Hendrix and The Who and all these classic rock bands that I didn't introduce my son to because I didn't expect him to be interested in it. But and he is. He's, he's an old soul, man. My, my youngest is, uh, it's, it's weird the way he is that way. But, um, but I love it and, and I learn every time. But he talked about the magic of that Dark Side of the Moon record 
And it's interesting to hear from a young person's perspective now, because we were young teenagers, right? When that record came out and you remember how it made you feel and you talk about the heart, you know, and how that, um, how that is your heart connectivity, right? And yeah, I remember being 13, 14 years old, my parents would leave me at a laser show, uh, you know, in Calgary. They, we drove up there from Montana. They just said, yeah. hey, go, go to the science center and we'll pick you up at midnight. Not yep. realizing that I was going to be hanging out with everybody smoking weed at a Laser Floyd show. The first time I heard Pink Floyd, but it was, a, it was a seminal moment, changed my life. And everything about the experience, including the songs and, and watching them and lasers and whatever sub secondhand smoke I had in me. But, uh, but yeah, there is an emotional connection to those records that is hard to replicate in these days, especially in electronic sounds and, you know. I mean, David Gilmour... Yeah. I mean, I mean the whole Roger Waters, David Gilmore thing we could get into for sure. hours, but like, but, and Alan Parsons and, and that whole team, I mean, there was a, there was some sort of British arrogance that happened during that time period. They had something to prove. I don't know what happened in the fifties and sixties in, in, in London or in England, per yeah. se, but there was some, there's this really sexy arrogance from engineers and bands like that's what you had this invasion you know right. they were like well the people here don't like what we're doing so let's go over the pond right and it was really interesting because it dovetailed into the 70s and the 80s hence the band you play with right now right like i mean like i was a huge like ultra vox fan oh and, like, you're man yeah uh i mean like xtc you bet um like you know, what's that general and major stuff like that, right? You know, Roxy Music, and Roxy Music, yeah, um, yeah. the list goes on, right? And, um, and and I was just gonna say, you know, um, uh, Donald Fagan and like, like, see, I love like Steely Dan and stuff like that, so it's really hard to to kind of z laser in and zoom in on something that's so impressionable on us, you know, right. sure. And, and not know. have it be so personal. I know that, you know, um, I would bet that if I talked to 10 different producers, they don't have a different idea about the perfect record, Absolutely. which is cool, but I love what they feel most connected to, you know? So if I knew that if I was going to hire Chuck Alcazian to do my record at Pearl Sound Studios, mm -hmm. I know that he could help me find my voice in this way. You know, I, I, um, I know that, uh, there were some records to me that I bands that I was recording with right after that I thought, Oh my God, I love that sound. I want yeah. that sound. That sound. Yeah. Throw, throwing copper. The live record was one that I thought, Oh man, I need that in me. I need me in that, you know, just to, and you know, in the eighties, you know, you think about those big bombastic Tommy Lee sounds, you know, and Alex Van Halen. Oh my God. I mean, can you give Jesus. me drums? Right. What the what the hell is a fucking roto tom? Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So but, I see I, I see Van Halen. Yeah. On the Diver Down tour, 1982. Right. Oh man. Okay. Eddie's kicking the cabinets over. Right. The speakers <laughs> yeah. are going like this. Right. And then Alex has got like horns in his kick drum. Right. <laughs> right. And That's I'm like, what the hell is this? And then I see like. <laughs> And he's going into the, we're getting into the 1984 Ted Templeman situation, right. right? We're getting into this drop dead legs moment, right? And I'm watching him play, you know, where have all the good times gone? You know, they had to get that Diver Down record out to Warner Brothers quick. So that's right. why there's so many covers on that, right? Yeah. And uh, short and long, but I saw that tour and I was like, holy shit. They had like this lion. Remember the lion on the yeah, t-shirt? That's right. Yeah. And they didn't even know how to market this moment. It was right. just like, they just threw a bunch of shit in the pot and said, <laughs> well, Van Halen, who cares? Let's kick ass, right? Okay. But, but Alex went ham. He's got like eight bass drums, you know. He's got rototons. He's got octobonds. He's got everything Stuart Copeland brought. Right. He's got all this shit. It was like, oh my goodness gracious. I was like, this is rock and roll, you know? Yeah. And I just ate that shit a lot, you yeah. know? As we all did, man. Yeah. And it was, it was amazing. That's part of the heart stuff. You know, that really is what makes it special for you. It's great that you came in a generation that was so uh, 
you know, formative and your pubescent years, right? You know, because you kind of grew up as a, it was a relationship you had with music that was very much like a girlfriend, you know? See, now I never met my real dad. Oh, really? Okay. My parents got divorced right before I was born. Okay. While I was in vitro or in utero, yeah. whatever the in vitro fertilization, that's not what I wanted to say. In utero. Right. You're in her belly. I was in the belly. Yeah. Anyways. And I was like, I was always like, um, feeling, um, I'm going to get deep here for a minute. Um, not alone. I was never alone, but, um, you always feel abandoned a little bit. Everyone has that feeling of mom, are you coming home or you know, Auntie, are you coming home? Or is everything cool? Is Skylab gonna fall on our house? And right. Us? Right. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And music is and was, I think, all of our our little sanctuary, our little Zen place. Where I don't care if it was Muskrat Love. Right. I don't care if it was Eclipse. I don't care if it was Strutter. It just did something to you that made you go. Oh man. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. You know, it's okay. And and what's really funny is I found the arts in general. I was the first kid to watch to stay up and watch Dukes of Hazard. I watched a Carol Burnett show. I'd watch Sonny and Cher with Jeff Percaro on right. it. I'd watch Midnight Special. I'd watch Solid Gold. Anything that I could get my hand kids are people too. Right. Yeah. Anything to get my fucking hands on. Because while we, we didn't have the internet, we had Circus Magazine. We had 17 or 16 right. or whatever the hell it was called. We had, I mean, Metal Edge didn't come out until the late 80s. Or right. Hip Parader. We had Modern Drummer, thank yeah. God. Thank God. Robin Flans, if you're watching, hi. Mm -hmm. You know, um, all that shit was what we, we didn't, we couldn't go on YouTube. Right. Oh, and yeah. study Terry Bazio. Right. We had to watch the Us Fest with Gail with had Slurpee cups on right. and Warren playing guitar. And I'm right. like, what the hell is that guitar? There's no headstock on it. Right. It was a Steinberger or something. Right. Yeah, that's right. Everything was all like super cool and like, yeah. What the hell? You know? <laughs> that's a whole nother interview. No, I know. But I, um, you know, it's, it's really cool to have that. We were really fortunate to have mm -hmm. that. And I think, right now when the world is crazy that that is the one thing that kind of center and ground people you know people are des me. they're desperate for the live connection where they can get out and see live bands i see that a lot people can continue to ask you know when are you going to be playing shows and we actually have a handful of shows that are coming up that i'm surprised about i'm excited i'm very excited about and uh, can't wait to play i uh, i know for me it's the one thing that keeps me sane, grounded, alive. And Absolutely. Uh, I, um, having music as such a uh, close ally, uh, a partner, you know, it's, ah. uh, it won't let you down. Boom. Boom. That's exactly, you nailed it right on the head. An ally. Yeah. Music is your ally. It will not let you down. It won't talk back to you. Right. It won't tell you you're a piece of shit. It won't tell you to not do something. Right. And it and it's like music is like your mom. It guides you. Sure. Or your parents. Yeah. Or grandparents. Yeah. And and you can allow it to guide you where you want it to go. You know, right. I mean if it if it's a song or a go to record that you listen to when you're sad, to continue mm -hmm. feeling sad but being okay with it and to really feel that. You feel oh. the feeling. I mean we have those things, right? That that uh it's it really is a blessing to have that connection with music, right? It's funny. There's, it's funny. There's a song by the Stylistics. Do you remember the band, the Stylistics? I don't know them. Okay. Yes, you would. They have a song called "You Make Me Feel Brand New." Oh, I didn't realize that was theirs. Yeah. Okay. When every time I hear that song, I cry like a baby. Oh man. Because the way it modulates, there's two songs that make me get really emotional. Where I don't care who's in the room. Yeah. Is uh, there? I, I, you'll see tears running down my face. It's um, that song, because there's this, there's this dynamic of the modulation, the, the chords that are used, okay. affect, they, they vibrate me in a different manner. You bet. And there's also, um, a song it's, um, 
it's it's called Overjoyed by Stevie Wonder. Oh man, yeah, you can't go wrong there. Um, I'll throw one more in there. Um, How deep is your love? By oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, ballads. I you know I love that song. Um, when I I played enough cover bands that played How Deep Is Your Love that kind of ruined it for me which is too bad because that is a it's a brilliant song man one of the greatest ballads out there but but uh yeah but stevie yeah there's not a lot of songs that wouldn't make you cry he's he's using a synclavier with like birds and water sounds as a drum track right yeah (laughs) oh man yeah buddy i love those I, i i love that uh you're exposure to so many different styles and genres has really made you more than just an encyclopedia of music, but it really gives you an opportunity to express creativity through the messaging at all these bands. I think what a gift to be able to work with you in the studio because you have really, Thank man, you. I, I, I can't wait. I hopefully I'll get to record with we you. Are Pearl Sound. So I, I, I know that you've actually mixed some drums that I did for skill in there. I, I hope you didn't yeah. have to do too much beat detective, but, but no, uh, I, I actually he'll slap the shit out of me. If I do that, yeah. I secretly <laughs> line things up. Okay. Nice. Uh, I, uh, your, your meter is really good by the way. I appreciate that, man. I still haven't gotten to hear those songs. He was going to send me some stuff and I haven't gotten to hear them. So maybe I'll go through you, but, uh, I'll send them to you. I would love it. I would love it. You know what, man, more than anything else, as I said, before we started the conversation, I want this, you mentioned, you know, it'd be fun to talk technical stuff. And we got into those kind of weeds more than anything. I knew the first time I met you that the depth behind Chuck Alcazian <laughs> was uh, was somebody that I wanted to connect with. And uh, Thank you. I, man, I, I feel so lucky to be, I don't know how it is, man, but some, for some reason, when I'm out on the road or when I'm doing whatever, I'm in the grocery store, I seem to get attracted to people that are just uh, inspiring to me in a bunch of different ways. And uh, man, I, I just, I got to tell you, man, I, I, I feel uh, forever indebted to Mike Skill for introducing us there at uh, the backstage area. And uh, man, I, I just, I, I appreciate you spending time this afternoon, man. You know, I really, oh. we, uh, oh, you're, dude, you're breaking me up, man. Well, like, this is like serious shit to me. Like, I love, I love that I even am blessed to even like hang with you and chat. And I know it's like the mutual admiration society here, but like on some real shit, like yeah. I, I just, I just, all I really want is for people to understand that life is good. Yeah. Music is good. Yeah. And people are good. And just, you know, we're going through these, these trying times. I know you're coming to a close here and, and I don't want to get on another soapbox, but um, it's not as bad as everyone thinks it is. I think, I know it's bad for a lot of people and I know we've all gone through our problems and we've all had our druthers and stuff and, if you could just step back for a little bit and go, hmm. someone's yeah. watching this right now. I hope we, me and you as a team, it's not an I thing. This world yeah. isn't about an I. This is about a we. And uh, well, that was a vibrating thing. We, yeah. Me and you as a team. I, oh, you got the Facebook on. I, I do, but I was trying to get this. Can you hear this going on? Wow. Wow. Yeah. Haven't heard it in 30 years, man. Yeah, there it is. But it's the truth. Yeah. All we need to do is stay together. You know, that's what the whole and point of this is all about, man. You know, we, we can share that, you know, that share that sentiment and we can do it through music. We do it through the show. We do it through uh, whatever communication you have with people online. You know, but yeah, I, I'm glad to have you as an ally, my friend. Yeah. I love you dearly. And I, I think we should do another one of these in a few months. And I, when, when skills in here, I want to do one with skill and me and you. I would love that. I'd be honored, man. We'll do it. Um, 
because I think we could bring up some really cool stuff because really everything that we're talking about is so tailored towards everybody. It's, yeah. It's, Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm a man of love, my brother. I love it, man. That's why uh, we resonate, man. So uh, keep smiling. Keep that love forward. And uh, thank you for hanging out with me, everybody. Thanks to Chuck Alcazian. Uh, some, my, somebody's revving their engine behind me just to say thanks. It sounds like sounds like a nice engine. Yeah, that, that might be my kiddo's car. Uh, awesome. I'm going to be signing off for a few days. The next uh, All Access Live that I'm going to do is in three days with my father who is a very uh, introverted uh, person, but he's an amazing artist. And I can't wait to share some uh, behind the scenes work as he uh, is 86 years old and prepping for a, an art show coming up here. God in bless him. Yeah, Give man. him my love, please. I will. I will. Chuck Alcazian, I love you, brother. Thank Rankin. you for being here. Have a gorgeous week, will you? You too, my brother. I love you. Love you too, man. Thanks for being here. Peace. God bless.